scripture today is from Luke chapter 1, verses 5 to 38. And the story of Christmas really doesn't begin with the birth of Jesus, but there was one other important birth that happened just before it. That was the birth of John the Baptist, who was probably second cousin to Jesus, that Mary and Elizabeth, John's mother, uh, were kinswoman, women, and uh, uh, but the, it all happened together. And uh, so we're going to read the story of how it was announced to Zechariah and Elizabeth, and then how it was announced to Mary. And uh, then, of course, we notice the reaction of those to whom the, gave, the, the angel Gabriel appears here in these stories. Listen now to God's Word. It's found on page... Um, whoops, I didn't put it in there. So you see, I did the bulletin today. I didn't look it up and put it in there. Uh, but that, what's that? 723. 723 in your New Testament you'd like to follow along. <clears throat> In the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah of the tribe of Abijah. And he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. But they had no child because Elizabeth was barren, and they were both advanced in years. Now while he was serving as priest before God when his division was on duty, according to the custom of the priesthood, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And the whole multitude of the people were praying outside at the hour of incense. That was believed to be he was entering directly into the presence of God there. And, Zech and uh, there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And Zechariah was troubled when he saw him and fear fell upon him. But the angel said, do not be afraid, Zechariah. For your prayer has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great before the Lord. And he must not drink wine or strong drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. And Zechariah said to the angel, How shall I know this? For I am an old man, and my wife is advanced in years. And the angel answered him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I was sent to speak to you to bring you this good news. And behold, you will be silent and unable to speak until the day that these things take place, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time. And the people were waiting for Zechariah, and they were wondering at his delay in the temple. And when he came out, he was unable to speak to them, and they realized he had seen a vision in the temple. And he kept making signs to them and remained mute. And when the time of his service was ended, he went to his home. After these days, his wife Elizabeth conceived, and for five months she kept herself hidden, saying, Thus the Lord has done for me in the days when he looked on me to take away my approach among people. In the sixth month of that pregnancy, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. Of David. And the virgin's, Mary, virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. And he will be great and will be called Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be, be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be, since I am a virgin? And the angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has conceived a son, and is in, this is the sixth month with her, who was called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. 
Open our hearts to the mysteries and joys of your word, O oh Lord, that we might know them and celebrate them together. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now, before I get going, I need to enlist a little help here. My friend Linus. <laughs> from Charlie Brown Christmas. He's going to help me in a little while. Christmas angels are a great thing. How many of y'all like angels? Anybody here not like angels? I'm all for angels. I need all the angels I get. My guardian angel probably is like this much of the time. <laughs> what can he do again? So, but uh, I need all the help I can get. I'll take divinely inspired help any time I can get. Now think about the angels on your Christmas cards and are in Christmas displays this time of year. What do they look like? Are they warm and friendly and fuzzy? They have pretty faces and they smile. Some are like nice little uh, young mothers or others look like surfer dudes with flowing blonde hair and stuff like that. Or like this one up here. So is that a scary angel? A fearsome angel? Well, we tend to water down our view of angels a little bit from what they experienced in the Bible when they showed up along the way. Uh, uh, they're not domesticated and tamed in the Bible at all. Uh, when God acts and sends some supernatural uh, visitors and messengers, it's not a trivial thing. It shapes the foundation of whoever experiences their presence, to say the least, if not all of human history. Because when these angels spoke, they were telling people that, they, uh, that these people were witnesses and participants in uh, events that we celebrate today, 2,000 years later, as some of the central events of our human experience. The chaos breaks out when they step into the world. You have raw, pure, holy, supernatural power entering our ephemeral world, and what do the people do when they see those angels? What do they feel? Fear. They are troubled. They are disturbed. They, 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 they cower down. Some fall down on their face. But what's the angel tell them? Do not be afraid. Or as we said in our participatory Christmas story last, fear not. Yeah, you can knock it down to two words. Fear not. So let me ask you, what does the angel say to Zechariah when he falls down in fear? Fear not. What did he say to Mary? Later when they appeared to the shepherds, what did the angel say? Fear not. What about Joseph when he had a dream about putting Mary away and the angel came and spoke to him there? Fear not. Fear not. Go to the other end of the story of Jesus. When the women came to the tomb and they found the stone rolled away and an angel appeared there, what did he say? Fear not. Fear not. When the angels show up, our first reaction is to fear because this being is so big and powerful, but they reassure us. They are there because God is on our side and God wants to do good things for us. So we do not have to be afraid. And we go through life afraid of things bigger and more powerful than us. Even God's presence and God's plan scares us at times. And we wonder what's going on? What's this going to do for me? Well, whatever God does for us, it's always the best thing possible. See, God is acting on our behalf. When God comes down here and sends an angel or even follows up with the birth of Jesus, God is love, God is merciful, or God is Emmanuel, which means God is with us, as the Bible tells us. That's what the whole Christmas story is about. God is with us. God's no longer up there throwing thunderbolts down at us as some people incorrectly uh, characterize him as doing. No, God comes down here as one of us to hear us, to experience our hurts, to calm us. So when God came down here, did he come in his full power and glory? If an angel comes in power and glory, what would happen if the infinite creator of the universe came down here? We'd probably melt, wouldn't we? Literally. I mean, I mean, when God appeared on Mount Sinai to the Israelites, only Moses could go up and get near him. Everybody else was afraid to see him there. And the same would happen today if God came down to us. So the Christmas story is that God is with us, but God also had to take on a disguise. 
God had to turn down the volume and the power and the light, so to speak, so that we could appreciate his presence here with us and he wouldn't blow us away, quite literally. You see, as we studied in Hebrews the last couple of weeks, Jesus became lower than the angels that we might become greater than the angels. In fact, the New Testament says we will even judge angels someday as Christ's servant. But see, Jesus came down here, he assumed our weakest form. A newborn infant. Is there anything more helpless than a new baby? We got one over there. Can little Melody fend for herself? Can she feed herself? Brush her teeth? Drive a car? Do anything like that? No. She's completely helpless, dependent on her mother and father. And uh, so that's the way God came to us and Jesus. Jesus also assumed our trials and temptations, and he overcame them. Jesus assumed our experience of rejection and scorn that the world oftentimes throws at us. What did he get when he entered into Jerusalem? Uh, triumphant one day, but five days later, what were they yelling? Crucify. Crucify him. Crucify him. So he knows what rejection and scorn is all about. He assumed our experience of physical death. He perished on the cross. So he knows what it means to give up all life and hope and just waste away and disappear, what our deepest fear is. But then what happens at Easter? He comes back from all that and shows his full power and persona. They are finally revealed that God, his son, is here who conquers sin and death. He is the Messiah. He's the one in whom we can put our trust. He's the one who demands our ultimate allegiance, and we gladly give it. Therefore, we do not have to be afraid. God is with us, Emmanuel. God is on our side. Or what the old non-Christmas hymn says, what a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Need, have we any pains or sorrows? Take it to the Lord in prayer. Uh, God is there with us. We have a friend in Jesus. And all of our insecurities are answered. Now, I have my little friend Linus here. How many of y'all like to watch Charlie Brown Christmas? We watch it every year. 50th anniversary this year when it first came on. And the thing that's unique about Charlie Brown Christmas is it doesn't water down the Christmas story at all. Uh, but they all run around dealing with their personal questions and concerns. And Linus has his security blanket because he is a frightened little child, so he needs to hold on to his blue blanket or turn it into a, uh, a shepherd's, uh, uh, whatever you call the head covering there. I don't know what it's called. So. But he turns it into that and uh, poses like that. But if you watch the video, something very interesting happens. You know, it's famous because Linus goes out and answers Charlie Brown's question, what is the meaning of Christmas? And let me turn on the handheld mic here, and we will get his version, or uh, his rendition, of what Christmas is all about. the meaning of the Christmas. And it goes on, and the angels sang all around about them and uh, celebrated its meeting. So, uh, and that's what we uh, celebrate here together today. But when, if you go back and watch the video, when Linus goes into that speech, he does something that's the only time it happens in the whole show. He drops his security blanket. I posted something about this on Facebook this week. And it's saying that when we hear uh, the story of Jesus and enter into his presence, we don't need to hold on to the things that try to comfort us in this world, that we have something bigger and better. We don't have to be afraid. We don't have to feel insecure. Jesus is here, and he is comforting us and taking care of our needs. See, Jesus relieves all our insecurities. He conquers all of our bad habits. Much of the, 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 that story is they're trying to talk Linus as giving up his silly blanket. 
And Snoopy runs away with it at one time. And Lucy, his sister, chastises him. But he holds on to it until he gives the Christmas story. And then he doesn't need it any longer. There's one other place in the story where he gives up his blanket. Can you remember where that is? Remember Charlie Brown's little Christmas tree that wilts and Charlie Brown thinks he killed it? Well, Linus takes his blanket and wraps it around the base and it revives. And so it's kind of his way of saying, okay, I give what I have, whatever I have, to, to help revive this and take care of Charlie Brown. So Linus is a good example of somebody who knows what Christmas is about and because of that, he is no longer afraid. All of his securities, insecurities, are gone, he puts his trust in the Lord. And that's what makes that a great Christmas special. I recommend watching it. We're going to watch it tonight uh, with the kids and probably with the youth uh, some too. I've got the DVD and we'll set it up and uh, it's always a great one to watch. It has great music with it and stuff too. <coughs> but the truth is Jesus really is our answer for everything so we don't have to be afraid. If you have fallen in sin and done things that you know that God is not pleased with or even you are not pleased with or the people around you, what does Jesus do? He forgives us and wipes away that sin. If you have failed in life and fallen in despair and think that you'll never have another opportunity, what does Jesus do? He lifts us up and says, I am with you and I am for you. If you are lost and confused and have no purpose in your life, what does Jesus do? He says, I call you, I claim you, I make you one of my disciples. Go and spread the gospel to all the nations and do my work in the world. If you're afflicted with disease and facing an early demise, what does Jesus do? One, Jesus can heal you. Sometimes that happens. Other times he goes with you, even to the point of death. And then finally, if you're facing old age, you know that your time in this world is running out because... None of us lasts here forever. What does Jesus do? For God so loved the world that he gives his only begotten Son so that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. What fear can we have that's any greater than those that I just listed there? Jesus addresses them all. The tragedy of this world is that people refuse the simple answer that God gives to every dilemma. That answer is not a program or a government system or anything like that. It's a person. It's the person, Jesus, born as a baby, raised to be a man, dies on the cross, and rises from the tomb. This is what God gives us. Well, let me wrap up. Let me give you a little quote about faith that I think fits into this that I found recently. Faith is not about everything turning out okay. Faith is being okay regardless of how things turn out. If we put our trust in God, we can handle